Good morning. Got a cup of coffee. Been sick for the past few days. Got a new got a new mic. Probably sounds exact the same because it's the same mic. Making this video almost killed me. How to win against Flesh Eater Quartz, the new book. The idea behind this video is that I was going to learn all of the new books as they come out, forward to backwards, thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly. And in my process of learning and understanding how these how these RVs work, that I would, from a Greenskins perspective, think about how to overcome them and how to beat them. So I hope that you learn something from my efforts, and I hope that I learn something from your efforts in the comments section and in the Discord. Thanks to my patrons. Let's go. Okay, TLDR. For those of you that just want us that want just the short of it, here it is. The whole army centers around their heroes. The heroes cast spells, chant prayers, and deal damage to generate stacks of up to six deed points. They then spend these points on recursion. They can bring back models from units, and they can also bring back slain units at half strength. But they can also bring back models from recurred half strength units back to full. So if there's a unit of 40 ghouls and you kill all the ghouls, you bring back 20 ghouls, but then you can bring back 20 more ghouls and bring them back up to full strength. And you can do this with Rally as well as with the, the mechanics in the book. It is bonkers. So the, the strategy is kill the heroes and win the game. If you're not killing heroes and you're just killing units, you're wasting your time. It's, it's a death faction. If you're not getting rid of the sources of recursion, you're, you're not preventing the recursion. If you're not preventing the recursion, you're not winning. The army as a whole has gen generally has poor rend and f deals few mortal wounds. So if you can if you can save stack, right? Like your Ard boys are going to be good here. But even save stacking and uh, all out defense and all that is going to be good. So we, you know Ard boys have th have a three up save, but if you can all out defense them and Mystic Shield them, and your opponent has one rend, you're on twos. Like, you're not taking damage. There's no mortals going through there, either. And then, your opponent's army, on the other hand, has very bad saves. So there's a lot of, like, four, like five ups and worse, right? Like, I'd say, like, the, probably the average of the army is, like, a five up save plus or minus one. So if you have rend, throw rend at them. Rend is fantastic against this army. They are a melee heavy army. They do have some good shooting, so you have to be careful for that. Uh, but it's only one unit that has good shooting. Um, and it's not even, it's like a very short range. I think it's even 10 inches. It's a very short range shooting. More on that later. But, um, so, uh, so just keep that in mind. They're going to be coming at you in melee, trying to get you. Let's see what else here. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, abhorrence. There, there's a few different keywords that we'll talk about, but the abhorrence they all have names like abhorrent ghoul king abhorrent uh uh whatever that's how they're named so the abhorrents they bring back slain units and then courtiers they bring back slain models so they'll be like again th th they will be named like that right so just as a quick example let's see here um you know abhorrent gore warden abhorrent arc regent abhorrent ghoul king uh, roll, uh ooh, actually the courtiers don't have it as much marrow scroll herald crypt ghast courtier vargulf courtier so not all the heroes are, are named in this way but a lot of them are so it's just very easy to remember uh if you have if your opponent is playing right so the thing with the courtiers and the abhorrence is when you're, when you're thinking about which heroes to prioritize you have to think about what stage of the game you're in, what uh, your opponent is playing, and would you rather shut off their ability to bring back slain units, or would you rather shut off their ability to recur models in a unit? It kind of depends, right, on, on how you're kind of thinking. If they're playing a big block of 40 ghouls, and you're like, well, I want to reduce that 40 ghouls to 10 ghouls, but I don't want to kill it, well, then you probably want to get rid of the courtier that's standing beside them, right, and then not uh, value the abhorrence, right, because if you're not going to be killing models, then you're not going to be bringing models back right like if you're if you got a bunch of art boys and you're gonna be like well they're not gonna kill me and so i'm not gonna kill them well then maybe you know or but i am gonna be killing them i don't know but you kind of understand what i'm what, I, what i'm saying here right it's like you you need to decide which of these two hero types you're gonna value 
over the other ones and you're going to be killing all of them hopefully ushuran is a beast he is the new model he's the big boy and if you're going to try to kill him you have to put everything that you can into taking him down no half measures he heals 2d3 he has a four up save he has a five up ward he he's going to generate a ton of noble deeds He's got a 30 inch buff range that you can change the buff every every turn, more on that later. Like, you need to deal a lot of wounds to him. I have here about 48 successful wounds. So you need to say to your opponent, like, like that, that you'll you have to force your opponent to make 48 saves before you kill him. Mortal wounds skip over that, right? But if you're just talking about raw pure damage in one turn to kill him. Because then after that he's gonna heal 2d 2d3. He's going to have inspiring presence uh sorry heroic recovery he's and he has a bravery of 10 so like if you're going to kill him you need to put everything that you can into him you need to kind of overkill him and he's scary we'll talk we'll talk about him in more detail later um they have a single cavalry unit um it's called morbhag knights i don't know why i didn't include their name in there they when they charge they turn off unleash hell and they deal impact mortals and they're scary so if, if your opponent's playing these knights, which you probably will see, just remember that Unleash Hell isn't going to save you. So you need to uh, to think about how you're positioning. They also have a 2-inch range. So don't put something like a line of roots right in front of a line of bolt boys, because those bolt boys will get will get killed. They have a single teleport scroll on the uh, Abhorrent Gore Warden's War Scroll. Um, so the he can take units out of flying, units out of combat, uh, and teleport them across the map and you can also deep strike with a unit of uh, flying units so and then the recursion where they bring back models they can bring back their dead units wholly within six inches of a board edge and outside of nine inches of you but the abhorrent arc regent has a spell that lets you then it lets you move any setup unit d6 right after being set up so um you this doesn't work with the teleport but this does work with your uh, initial deep striking of units as well as your recursion of bringing back dead units it does those things so uh it's really scary it's really scary so you need to watch your back the entire game the entire game you need to think within six inches of the board edge outside of nine you need to zone out your back line all the time so this is one of those armies everybody you got to be very careful. They're not coming in within a grave site, right? They're coming in within six, six inches of the board edge. So watch your back. Okay, that's the end of the TLDR. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So the army has four important keywords. Two of them apply to battle line units and like just whatever units. And then two of them apply to um, heroes. So you have serfs. So these are... Crypt Ghouls, which are always battle line, Crypt Guard, and Royal Beast Flayers. Crypt Guard can be conditional battle line, and Royal Beast Flayers cannot be battle line. Serfs tend to be one wound each. They're the smaller. They tend to be on like 25 mil bases, thir maybe 32 mils, I'm not exactly sure. And then you have Knights. So these are the more elite uh, infantry. So we have the Morbheg Knights. Those are the crazy cavalry units. We have Crypt Horrors, which are conditional battle line, and Crypt Flayers, which are also conditional battle battle line these guys are like on your 40 millimeter basis your 50 millimeter basis i think that horrors and flares are both on 50s and the more peg knights are on um, ovals of some kind so these are much bigger then you have courtiers which we talked about a little bit these are your heroes that bring models back to units so you have crypt hunter courtier crypt infernal courtier varghulf courtier crypt gas courtier royal decapitator and meryl scroll herald We'll talk about all of these in detail later, but just to give you a sense of how the army works. And then you have Abhorrence. So Abhorrence are your uh, units that bring back your... Um, bring back slain units. These are your wizards. These are your priests. These are your backline heroes. The courtiers, there's... I think between all of them, I think there's exactly zero wizards and priests in the courtier ranks. So they all have to deal melee damage to generate their points. More on this later. But the Abhorrents are your... Um, they are your spellcasters and your priests. And so they're able to generate points that way. But, you know, 
just keep in mind that you do have these two sort of like battle line keywords and these two hero keywords that matter and they're important. And I, I put them first in this list here so that we could make sure that um, as we went through the book, we understood what these keywords sort of mean. Okay, so as we go through all of the stuff in this list, I have all of the information up on screen, but I'm not going to go over all of the information up on screen. I'm only going to really talk about the things that you're that you're likely to see. I'm going to talk about all the enhancements and units and etc. that I think through my my own readings and my research and consultation with other people. Shout out to the Flesh Eater Quartz Discord that I joined. And uh, shout out, oh, what's that guy's name? Zeno. Shout out to, uh, to Zeno for, uh, for all his help. And there's another guy too in there. Oh man, I can't be freaking, can't be dropping shout outs, Moss. <clears throat> that's, that's terrible. Anyway, uh, shout out to the Flesh Eater Quartz. Oh yeah, Saturn, Saturn boy. Thanks uh, for you guys. You guys were a uh, very big help in telling me why I was wrong about all my, about all my opinions. <laughs> but, I, but honestly. So I'm only going to cover the things that I think are good. Okay? So... Of all the sub-factions, the one that you'll probably see the most, the one that you might only see, to be honest, is called Hollow Morn. What it does is it adds one to the damage characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Hollow Morn knight, knight units that have made a charge roll in the same turn. This ability has no effects on attacks made by mounts. So there's good knights in this book. There's good knights, and the knights hurt. They slap. So uh, when they charge, they slap even harder. And Hollow Morn also unlocks the Crypt Horrors as battle line, and they're a pretty good unit, especially when you reinforce them once or twice. They start to get really scary. So, uh, very good sub faction. It might be the only one that you'll see. It, there's the, one of them is also a um, uh, like a monster mash one where you can bring like monsters without riders as battle line units. Meh, it's fine. And there's also Morghaunt, which. Uh, whenever your heroes are standing on objectives, they get a deed. At the end of each of, at the end of each turn, they generate a deed point if they're contesting an objective. They don't have to control it; they just have to be contesting it. You might see that one too, but I doubt it. I bet you it's Hollow Morn all the way. Let me say this: if you're playing against a, a feck player and they're not playing Hollow Morn, you can think to yourself, "Okay, like this isn't going to be an optimized list." I think that that's true. Let me know in the comments. Let me know in the Discord what you think. If you're a patron, I automatically just agree with whatever you have to say. So that's that's the that's the one perk about being a patron. I just you just get you just you're just right. You're just right all the time. Court of Delusion. So this is another rule. In the first battle round, after the players have received their starting command points, but before the start of the first turn, you can pick one of them and you apply you apply this grand delusion to, to the table. It's to all units and all. Like there's no range, it's just you just get it. It's kind of like a dirty trick, right? It just it's a rule that you just get for that game. So here's a couple good ones. Uh, add one to run and charge rules for friendly feck units. So they all just get to they all just get plus one and they all just get uh, plus one to run, plus one to charge. So that means that when your opponent is bringing back units wholly within six outside of nine, that it's actually eight on the dice. That's a very significant mathematical change. Going from a roll of nine on 2d6 to a roll of eight on 2d6 is relevant and significant. And then adding one to roll, these knight units aren't super fast. I think like the, the Cryptors, I believe that they run at about a seven. They have a seven inch move, I think. Yeah, so being able to go uh, plus one to their, to their run rolls, like uh, it's okay, right? But it's that plus one charge, I think that's kind of scary. And then here's another one, uh, Feeding Frenzy. So we'll talk about this, I think, next. So it, it's an ability that lets you get plus one attacks. Um, applies to friendly feck units while they're wholly within 12 inches. of friendly, friendly hero with four, not six, four or more noble deed points. So uh, it's pretty good, but we'll talk about that here in a sec. Another one that's okay is you add one to save rolls for friendly feck units while they're contesting an objective you control. Like I said, it's a, it's a relatively weak army so there's some heroes and some some you know some of the monsters right that if you give them plus one to save for being on the objective and then you give them all out defense and then you give them mystic shield that they can kind of be like super tanky you know like it, at this point they're going from like a four to a three up save and ignoring two rends so that could be pretty good right but the rest of them are kind of are, are kind of whatever i would say that if if you're new to the army uh that these are like the two that you should anticipate 
and if you're reading about if you're going to play Fek, these are the two that you should anticipate. So when you read these abilities, like for example, actually you know what? Let's just skip ahead to uh, where is it here? Let's let's look at feeding frenzy since we're talking about it. Okay, so deathless courtier, all Fek units have a six up ward. I hate this. I hate this rule. I wish that this wouldn't happen. I think it's I think it's slow. I would rather them just have more wounds than have a have a board wide six up roll. I I don't know why. GW thinks that every single piece of damage for the entire game that we need to have that we need to roll for it. I just it's just it just I, I just don't like rules like this. It's too much it's too many dice rolls. I don't like it in, in Hammers of Sigmar, I don't like it in Bone Splitters, I don't like it here in Feck, whatever. It's like it's not very new player friendly, it's it's just at it's slowing down the game. It's like every piece of damage has to have a six of board. I don't know, whatever. But the the book has a six of board, fine. Okay, here's another one. Feeding Frenzy. So you add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons. It's a melee army used by friendly feck units while they're wholly within 12 inches of any heroes that have six or more noble deeds. So, uh, like I said, your heroes generate no noble deeds by fighting. I mean, sorry, I need to stay. Stop saying we. Their heroes generate no uh, noble deeds by casting spells, chanting prayers, and, uh, and, uh, dealing melee damage as well as being in their terrain piece more on that later uh and so when they get six or when they get four if you're choosing that grand illusion right so four is not that tough to get really then all of the uh units holding within 12 they get plus one attacks this is a high attack volume army and there's you can have a lot of units too like ghouls like you ghouls come in units of 20 so if you have 40 or 60 of them and you're giving them all one attack, like they uh, auto wound on sixes, I think. So like feeding frenzy can be kind of nutty. Uh, so keep that in mind. There's more attacks coming than you think. Okay. They have a couple of book heroic actions. They're called delusions of grandeur. Rousing oration. Pick one friendly feck hero and roll a die for each other friendly feck unit holy within 12 of that hero. For each five up, give one noble deed point to that hero. So there's like, you know, you can play like an MSU style or if you have three units that are holy within 12 of the hero, you can, you know, give it an extra deed. You can also maybe spike here too, but that's okay. You know, sure, that's fine. It's not, it's not, su it's not super good, but it, in my opinion, it's not super good. But if you look at their heroic actions, I don't think that a ton of them are super good. So if you don't need uh, best day ever, sorry, not uh, their finest hour. If you don't need their finest hour, if you don't need the command points, like this is gonna be fine. And then their other one is called Scent of Blood. Pick one friendly Fek hero and roll a die. For on a three up, you can make a D6 move with that hero, but it must finish that move more than three inches from all other enemy units and closer to the enemy units that has any wounds allocated to it. Like this one's okay. Usharan is a monster, or he's a hero. Sorry, not a monster. So. Uh, this one's okay they're you know uh but uh, both of these heroic actions are kind of like whatever they're, like they're fine they're not they're not amazing okay hero points oh one second pardon me so here are how the noble deeds work also called also kind of like hero points right noble deeds hero points each time a friendly feck hero successfully casts a spell that is not unbound give it one deed give it one point each time a, pr uh, a prayer chanted by a friendly feck hero is answered, give it a deed. Each time a friendly feck hero fights, after all of its attacks have been resolved, give that hero a number of noble deeds equal to the number of wounds and or immortal wounds caused by that hero in that phase that were allocated to the enemy units. Do not count wounds or mortal wounds caused by that hero's mounts. So this is very relevant when we start talking about the terror geists and zombie dragons, more on that later. Uh, each feck hero can have a maximum of six. It cannot be given more points until it until its maximum has been reduced from six. Okay, pretty straightforward. Cool. Here specifically, here are the recursion rules. So we have muster guard at the end of the movement phase. So both of these recursion rules come in at the end of the movement phase. At the end of the movement phase, each friendly courtier can spend one of their noble deed points to return one slain model to a friendly surf unit that is within, not wholly within, that is within 10 inches of them. Not wholly within, that is within 10 inches. Or two, they can spend two of their no no noble deed points 
to return one slain model to a friendly knight's unit that is within 10 inches of them. You can use this ability multiple times each turn as long as the required deed points are available. So if you have six points, um, then you can bring back three knights or six serfs. Cool. Seems good. Right? Seems good. Um, there's also a uh, command trait that cuts this in half. So one point brings back two serfs and one point brings back one knight. But we'll talk about that later. But it's it's possible. You can you can double this for one uh, for, for the general if the general is a courtier. Summon loyal subjects. At the end of your movement phase, each friendly abhorrent can spend six of their noble deed points to summon loyal subjects. If they do so, pick, pick one friendly serfs or knights unit that has been destroyed and add a new replacement unit identical to that unit to your army with half the models from this unit uh, that was destroyed rounding up. Replacement units must be set up wholly within 6 inches of the edge of the battlefield and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. Each destroyed unit can only be replaced once. Replacement units themselves cannot be replaced. Remaining models which are not set up as part of the replacement unit count as having been slain and can be returned to the replacement unit using the muster, using the muster card ability or the rally command. So good. So good. Oh man. Should not be sick for three days and be like, you know what? I'm going to record a video this morning. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to record a video. No, what I'm really going to do is leak out of my face all morning. And I'm going to leak out of my face into a microphone. Good job, boss. <laughs> Carrying on. Okay, so we talked about these. These other rules. Man, the recursion is so good. But at least you know exactly how you can turn it off. At least you know exactly how to turn it off. It doesn't have to be wholly within... T oh, anyway. They have some book monsters rampages. Meh. They're, they're meh. Like, they're not great. I'm just going to skip. I'm, they're not really, like, whatever your opponent is probably just going to roar. Okay, command traits. Let's get into some good command traits here. So we have Feverish Scholar. So this is for abhorrence only. So remember, this is your backline casters, right? So add one to casting rules, dispelling rules, and unbinding rules for this general. If this general has six noble deeds, add two to the casting rule, dispelling rule, and unbinding rules for this general instead of one. This is very good. The reason that's very good is because there's a lot of really good, really important spells in this book. So, uh, also, the throne, the charnel throne, uh, the faction terrain piece, you can put one hero in it, and at the, th at the start of the turn, they just generate D3 Noble Deeds. So, uh, you put Fever Scholar on a two-cast wizard, uh, you put it really far back at a range. This is if you're really trying to maximize your 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 magic, right? Like if your opponent is playing like some good unbinds or whatever, right? Like Obsprag, for example. So they generate D3 and then they cast two spells. Cool. So you're looking at four or five. So by turn two, they're, they're a plus two wizard. Making sure they get all their spells off. Kill it. Seems good. Uh... Man traits for uh, courtiers. Cruel Taskmaster. This is what I was talking about earlier. If this general uses the Muster Guard ability to return models to a unit, reduce the number of deeds deeds cost for each return model by one. Or if the cost was already one, you can bring back one additional model instead. So this means that one for, for the for the courtier for this general to do the uh, Muster Guard ability, it's going to cost one noble deed point for to bring back a knight. And it's going to cost one noble deed point to bring back a serf. That means you could bring back six cryptors. That means you could bring back 12 ghouls. And the thing with courtiers is the primary way that they're going to de uh, generate their noble deeds is by dealing combat in melee. Because they don't they generally don't have prayers or spells. So it means that you could like, um, in your movement phase... You spend all six points, or you spend however many points you bring to bring back models, and then uh, the courtier can fight first and generate up to six deeds right away, therefore unlocking feeding frenzy or four noble deeds if you have that grand illusion active. So now the unit that you just recurred is also getting feeding frenzy. So there are some interesting synergies that go on here. It can be pretty good. So. You're basically, if your opponent did not bring Cruel Taskmaster or Feverish Scholar as their command trait, they're not playing an optimized list, and that's good. 
but these are the, these are the two that you should really that you should look out for when you see them very good artifacts of power there's only really one that's okay for uh for abhorrence it's called the grim garland you subtract two from the bravery characteristic of the enemy units while they're within nine inches of the bear this doesn't sound super great but there are there are ways of abusing low bravery in your opponent uh, there are some shooting attacks and some other some other things that, that we'll see a little bit later but being able to take bravery away from your opponent it uh, can be good in this book and can synergize in this book especially against but um, shh, destruction armies we oh my oh my if, if we don't have inspiring presence if we don't get to inspiring presence a unit of bolt boys or a unit of gut rippers <coughs> or anything else like we suck with bravery which is dumb it's dumb for orcs to suck at bravery gets i get it but orcs no way but this uh this can really hurt us as destruction players so uh yeah keep that in mind however i don't think that that's primarily the one that you'll see you'll probably see on an artifact of power on a courtier because i think all of them are pretty good so we'll start with the best one charnel vestments so the bear gains the priest keyword they have a prayer on a three up you give a five up ward that's pretty good a three up prayer to give a five up ward is strong it also means that a courtier now is a priest which means they can generate noble deeds by chanting prayers so the charnel vestment i think is the best one and i think you'll see it a lot the other two however are also good there's medal of madness once per battle round the bearer can issue a command without a command point being spent and they are treated as if they were the general when they do so so it means they it's an 18 inch range so that's pretty good command points are good so getting a free command point per round is is good it's strong right this is a game of movement so that's an auto run that's a redeploy that's a that's a charge right fantastic and then the flayed uh, pennant you can reroll charge rolls for friendly feck units while they're wholly within 12 inches of the bearer there's some very aggressive movements that you can do in this in this in this army some very aggressive lists so being able to reroll charge rolls for feck units is good so all these are good good artifacts of powers for courtiers you'll probably see charnel investments though realm magic so let's see the season still has a few months left in it so there's a few locuses the abhorrent gore warden the abhorrent arc arc regent you'll probably see both of those and the abhorrent ghoul king probably won't see too much of him uh so they gotta they got they have some good options for andorian locusts and uh, you might see that acolytes battalion too because these these heroes are probably going to be included and they really they really like their their spells uh, primal magic since this army really wants to get their spells off making good use of their primal dice will be valued they are going to value using their primal dice to cast their spells they have good spells you should use your primal dice to value unbinds do not let them get their spells off it, it, it generates them deeds and the spells are good Horfrost. they have poor rend with a high volume of attacks Horfrost is very good crypt whores, for example get this okay so they come in units of three so there's three of them but they have four attacks each fours to hit threes to wound no rend zero rend and then two damage three damage if they're charging so if you get hoarfrost on them suddenly the unit of three is if they have feeding frenzy too they get plus one attack so a unit of three is 15 dice you know what let's just do this oh wait no this side let's see damage i'm just for those of you that are listening i'm just pulling up the uh damage calculator guy okay so there's three models and then let's say they have feeding frenzy off so they're gonna get uh five attacks this is if they're buffed they've seen all out attack uh, plus one they ha they have lots of ways of getting plus one to wound they have three rend and all of a sudden it's like uh wh where did it go all of a sudden it's three damage like it, they're gonna be dealing like this uh, on my thing here it says like 25 25 damage like it's nutty hoarfrost is very 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 good in this army if you're if your opponent is not taking hoarfrost then they are not playing an optimized list so that's good that's good same thing with the ghouls. The ghouls don't have rend either. There's ways that they can get rend, but uh, 
like let's see what does the crypt horrors say yeah so the crypt horrors right improve the rank characteristic of improve it by one if they are wholly within nine of a courtier or with or wholly within 18 inches of a friendly abhorrent so it's improve it by one so even if you cast horror frost they can still get it improved by one i think i might be wrong on that let me know in the comments am i wrong on that uh but let me know Uh, and Merciless Blizzard, There's, they have some good two-cast wizards that can take advantage of the spell. Scary. Okay, so their spells. So they have one spell called, called Miasma Shroud. Uh, it has, the whole screen is filled up with text, and it's not very good. You probably won't see it. A spell that they have that is really scary is Deranged Transformation. So it's, it has a casting value of 6 and a range of 24 inches, so low cast value, nice big range. If successfully cast, pick one friendly feck unit wholly within range and visible to the caster that has a wounds characteristic of seven, of seven or less. So not heroes is how it plays out. Not heroes. Um, until your next hero phase, add two to the unit's move characteristic and add one to the wound rolls for attack made by that unit. If the casting value was 10 or more, <coughs> primal dice. It just says casting roll, not unmodified. If the casting roll was 10 or more, you can pick up to three different units to be affected by the spell instead of one. So giving... You're, talk, you're saying giving uh, th you're giving three different units plus two to move and plus one wound if you're rolling your primal dice. Remember how I said that Feck is going to use their primal dice for casting? This is what I meant. Adding two to the move characteristic of three knight units to m zip them up the board and put them two inches closer to a charge uh, is good. It's good. It's very good. You're reducing the number, like, plus two to move... Is kind of like plus two to charge almost if that's your goal if your goal is to charge and you're moving two inches closer well that's a five inch roll instead of a seven inch roll for charge so being able to do this up to three times is good it's good so be careful these guys are coming for you right ghouls have a seven inch rate have a seven inch and then they can also do the grand illusion which gives the plus one to uh run so, like it's they're moving they are moving they're faster than, sorry, they're faster than I thought. I've played a few games against Feck. So, pretty good. Prayers. So, there's one really good one. Uh, Charnel Con Conviction. Uh, answer value of 3, range of 18. Pick one Feck unit wholly within range. Invisible. Gives it a 5 up board. Seems good. 5 up boards are good. Mount Traits. So... You're probably not going to see a lot of a lot of zombies, or sorry, a lot of monsters. Uh, so, one thing you just need to know uh, is that the royal zombie dragon can take a mount trait that lets it set up in reserve, and it comes down at the end of the first movement phase, wholly outside of nine. So that's just a thing that can happen. So you'll know that when the game starts, though. Your opponent will be like, "Oh, I put my 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 royal zombie dragon." in reserve it's like okay so they can do that that's the thing that they can do and the royal terror geist uh i probably should have highlighted it here but uh they add a one to the attack characteristic of fang Ma. this is the one that that you'll see from uh royal terror geist the fang Ma on a six when it attacks i think it's like four attacks but what it does is it gives uh, it does six mortal wounds if it hits on a six so it's good so that's the one you'll probably see but i don't think you'll see many of these guys anyway so for battalions i have a feeling that it's going to be battle regiment i have a feeling that you'll see two drop lists in feck i think that because they are they're like a fast um melee based army that has like deployment tricks and deep striking and other kind of stuff i think that they're going to want to control the tempo they're going to want to either alpha strike you if you made a mistake in deployment or they're going to want to force you to move up the board so that they can then counter punch you i think that's probably what you'll see i'm expecting two drops the only exception is if they want to go with an andorian locust to make sure that they get those uh extra dice extra primal dice then i think you'll see a three drop you'll see a battle rig and then you'll see the two locuses or the two andorian acolytes together so either two or three drops is kind of what I'm anticipating. I don't think you'll see Warlord. I don't think that there's a lot of enhancements that are worth taking. Just with a default list, I think that you kind of get everything that you want. So, seems good. 
Grand Strategies, Spellcasting Savant. That's what you'll see. The rest of them aren't as good. Spellcasting Savant. Kill the, if you kill those heroes, you'll win the game. This is There's there's just not very many good ones to, to pick. I think you'll just only see Spellcasting Savant, so kill their heroes. Uh, battle Tactics. Let's see. So they do have some D, some good book battle tactics. The way that I'm kind of feeling about book battle tactics right now is that if you have two good ones, you can make do. If you have three good ones, you're solid. If you have four good ones, you're overpowered. And by a good one, I mean one that you can reliably get every game without too much difficulty. So the effect book in my opinion, has three, depending on what you're running. So let's just review some of these briefly. The idea here is if you know what kind of battle tactics they can and can't do, you might be able to deny them their tactics. Okay, scream to death. Pick one enemy on the battlefield. You complete this battle tactic if the unit is destroyed this turn by an attack made by a missile weapon used by a friendly Crypt Flayers unit. So that's really what it is. There's, there's two others, but uh, Crypt Flayers have good shooting attacks low range but good damage if your opponent is playing crypt flares they can just kill your unit with attacks from the crypt flares so uh you know maybe if that's what you see on the table where the crypt flares are positioned to take on a low uh, a wounded unit you might consider mystic shielding them you might consider doing something to them to like moving them away right moving them back on your turn so that on your opponent's turn they can't just get an easy pick off with crypt flares it's good valiant slang pick one enemy monster on the battlefield you complete this battle tactic if the unit is destroyed during this turn by an attack made by a friendly abhorrent usheron is a big slappy monster abhorrent do not let usheron kill your monsters you'll be giving your opponent a free battle tactic if you put a monster up against usheron you better kill usheron don't let him kill, don't let him kill your mock Russia. Don't let him kill your sludge raker. Don't let him kill your gobsmack because your opponent's just going to be like, oh, free tactic. Seems bad. The rest of the opponents aren't going to kill your monsters. It's only going to be uh, Usheron. U Usheron, Ushorin, you tell me, I don't know, what do you think? Glorious Feast, you complete this battle tactic if every friendly unit on the battlefield is wholly within 12 inches of a friendly feck hero that has six normal deeds points at the end of the turn. So this is a win more battle tactic. This one shouldn't really be highlighted, but if you're, you're probably running five to six heroes, so if 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 your opponent is is beating you, and they're they're generating all these noble deed points, but they don't feel the need to spend them, this is just you for a you. It's a lose more battle tactic. So that this this one's kind of like whatever. I don't. I this one shouldn't be highlighted. I don't think it's it's re really relevant. But it's it wouldn't be that difficult to do. It's a really good round five one to do as well. Okay, Lance Formation. You complete this battle tactic if two or more friendly knights made a charge this turn and the charge rolls for each of those units was seven or more. So you're probably getting plus one to charge. So getting two six up charges on the dice is not that hard. There's also a way that, like from previous, uh, that you can reroll these charges and you can just spend a command point to reroll them. So this one's not that tough either. So they have good tactics. They have good tactics. Cool. Let's look at some of their key units. So I'm only going to discuss units that I think are good and that you will see. Um, these units represent the wizards and the priests of the army. They are, they are comfortable staying in the back and just generating points. They should be taken out before they get a chance to recur slain units. So if there's, if there's abhorrence on the battlefield and they've generated a bunch of points, if you kill a unit, it's just coming back. It's just coming back. So, gotta kill those. Gotta kill them. So, Yushorin, he's the big one. He's the new model. He has good damage. Let's just say he has enough to generate six points every time he slaps. Uh, he has a good AoE buff that requires no dice rolls. It gives a, It's a 30-inch range, and it lets you pick another Grand Illusion. So, uh, and there's at least two that are worth taking, probably three. So, he's really good. He's tanky. He heals 2d3 uh, in in the in their hero phase, and he has a 5-up ward, and he has 16 wounds, and he has 10 bravery. The 10 bravery is really good for heroic recovery. 
If you're going to try to kill this model, make sure you put everything you have into killing him. Nothing in the book, nothing in our book, is expected to deal this much damage alone. If you think a Maw Crusher with Destroyer going off on this guy is going to kill him, you're wrong. You're going to hit him, you're going to almost kill him, but you're probably not going to kill him. So, this is one of those like, okay, this turn I'm deciding I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill him. So, the Wargog Prophet's going to stare at him, the Bull Boys are going to shoot at him, I'm going to call my Cruel Boys Wa and put three units into him. Um, I'm going to like buff up my pigs and I'm going to send all my pigs in. It's like, it's one of those things. If you want to kill this guy, you have to dedicate everything that you have into killing him. It sucks, but it's what you got to do. You can't be like, oh, well, I'll shoot these other things and cast spells on these other things. And then my Maw Crusher or my Gore buffed up Gore Grunters are going in. It's like, nope, it's not enough. All or nothing on this guy. I recommend all, right? He is a hero. He's an abhorrent. He's going to generate deeds. He has good, sp anyway, <laughs> like he has good spells. He has a spell. His War Scroll spell lets you pick, uh, lets them pick one of your units and it fights a different one of your units. Like, he's got a long War Scroll. If you're going to play up against him, have a good read of his War Scroll spell. And then you have the Gore Warden for 150 points. Oh, you shorten to 460 points, by the way. It's 460 points. And he's worth his points. How about that? Gore Warden, 150 points. One spellcaster. He can take a flying unit into reserve and deploy it at the end of the movement phase. He can also teleport himself and a flying unit out of combat with a spell. Lots of mobility options here. He's fast too. He's got, he's got at least he's got at least a 12 inch um, flying movement. So this is a really good a Blizzard hero because you're gonna get to deploy him. Uh, you're gonna get to deep strike him with some more peg knights, and those knights are gonna charge in, and then he is set up the next turn just to cast Blizzard. So, or he can cast his Winds of Shaiish, which is where he picks up himself in a flying unit. Uh, yeah, seems good. Let's keep looking. So then we have the Abhorrent Arc Regent. So he's a two spell caster for 150 points. Every turn he has an ability called Countless Servants at the start of, of your at the start of their hero phase. So you're like the Flesh Eater Courts player's hero phase. You can return up to three slain models to one friendly surf unit that is within, not wholly within, just within 18 inches of this unit. Or you can return one slain model to a knight that is within 18 inches of this unit. So he just brings back stuff all by himself. And he's a two cast wizard. Cool. He also has a War Scroll spell called Carrion Call. This might be the best spell in the book. Casting value of six. No range. In the following movement phase, friendly feck units that are set up at the end of the movement phase can immediately move d6. I'll say that again. Casting value of six, board wide, deep struck and recurred units can move d6. So they have to be outside of nine. Okay, they get plus one to charge. Okay, they get to move d6. All right. So they can just go from a nine inch to a three inch charge on the roll of a die, and they can all do this anywhere on the table. Cool. So getting back to the Gore Warden, he can deep strike in a unit of, uh, like a unit of knights, like more peg knights, the cavalry, and then they just get to move d6 sick you have to screen out your back line because they are coming for you they are coming for you so good so good the arc region is going to be an auto include in every list and to be honest getting giving him plus one to cast with that command trait uh pretty good that'll probably be the default i think is going to be an arc regent sitting in the throne generating d3 points every hero phase and then him casting two spells like he's going to get up to six pretty fast and then he is going to uh be a plus two caster plus two casting the only thing i'm not sure about him is if you want him to stay really far away so that he can just cast carrion call every turn unmolested or do you put the throne far forward and him on the throne 
so that he can recur knights back. Right, because it has to be within 18 to bring ghouls and knights back. Or serfs and knights, I guess. So that's kind of the only thing about him I'm not sure. I also think he's probably the best hero in the book to have Horfrost on him, and so you can't be far back in casting Horfrost. I guess it depends on, on what you're valuing that game and what you think is important. So, I don't know. He's scary. He's scary for 150 points. And then we have the Abhorrent Cardinal. So this is the only priest in the book. Uh, he has a War Scroll spell called Speak in Tongues, has an answer value of 4 and a range of 18. If answered, pick one enemy unit within range invisible to the caster until your next hero phase. Roll the die each time that unit receives a command. On a 4-up, the command dies. So, pretty good. 120 points. It's pretty good. I, to be honest, I'm not sure if you'll see him because the other ones are just kind of... I think the other ones are just better. Right? The Gore Warden, like, deep striking stuff in is really strong. And uh, the Arc Regent is is really strong. And uh, Yushoran, Ushoran, Yushoran is really strong too. So those are the, but I think that those are the ones that you'll see. To be honest, I have a feeling you'll see the Gore Warden. Yeah, you'll see those three a lot. So, and don't forget all importance also heal D3 in their hero phase. And they have set, a lot of these guys have seven wounds. So the Abhorrent Arc Regent and the Gore Warden both have seven wounds. So, for a foot hero, 7 is a key number because it means they can't die to 2d3 damage or d6 damage. It means that they will survive that. No matter, like, there's no way that you can kill them in one cast with Gobsprack. I have blown up the heads of Grotz with Gobsprack. Uh, turn 1, their general casts a spell. I unbind it with Gobsprack. Pop goes their head. You can't do that with, in this book, in, in the feck book. They have 7 wounds, so they're going to survive, which is, which is a bummer. And they have a six aboard too. Okay, courtiers. So we have the Royal Decapitator. So this, I don't think this unit is super good, but I think people are going to run it. And so uh, you need to be aware that it exists. So for 100 points, it's a courtier. If it deals damage to a hero at the end of the combat phase, the unit it dealt, if the unit it dealt damage to is not destroyed, and if it is not destroyed on a five up, the, the hero is dead. So that means that if someone is playing this, you know, it's it's like a combo meme kind of thing, whatever. But if they play this and they run up and they hit you, hit, hit your Maw Crusher or hit your Sludge Raker or hit Gobsprack with it, you have to then kill it. Because if you don't, there's a 1 in 3 chance that you just lose your model. So he can be a little bit annoying, right? But, uh, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. I don't think he's very strong, but don't. Don't lose because of this. Don't lose a Maw Crusher because you put the Maw Crusher's damage into something else, forgot about this guy, and then lost it at the end of the turn. That would be a bummer. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I really like the Varghulf Courtier, but I don't think he's as strong as, as I value him. I think I overvalue him. First of all, he's on 145 points. He's 165 points, so he's quite expensive compared to the rest of the of the uh, courtiers. I mean, that point is going to probably come down because it is an increment of five, and so that'll probably get updated probably immediately. So he's fighty. He's mobile. He has a 10-inch move. He can fly over terrain. He has a four-up save, eight wounds, and he has an ability called... Um, King's Champion. At the start of the combat phase, you can say he's using this ability or whatever. If you do so, he adds two to the to his attack characteristic, and he has two different weapons. So he gets four additional attacks. He goes from six attacks to ten attacks, but he can only target units that have a wound characteristic of one or two and do not have a mount. So screens. Screens, battle line, chaff. He chews through them. His attacks are like threes and threes or threes and twos with one and two rend and two and three damage. So what he's good at is he's good at running around the battlefield and killing screens. So, you know, you put 10 Stabas or 10 Gut Rippas or 10 Hobgrots on an objective. This guy's coming for them. He's going to fly over the terrain. He's going to get to you. He's going to he's going to really chew you up real good. Generate six noble deed points. And then he has this other ability called Victory Feast at the end of the combat phase. If any enemy models were slain by wounds caused by this unit's attacks in that phase, which is likely, you can heal d6, and then 
he can immediately retreat. So he's going to run up, he's going to eat your stuff, and then he's going to move 10 more inches. Right? Um, and then so for the following move phase, he's ready to spend his points to bring back models. I know I like him. I wish he was cheaper. If he was cheaper, I might play him, but I don't know. Yeah, he can generate a lot of deeds because he's he is the fightiest courtier by a lot. So Crypt Infernal Courtier. This one is also very good. This one, uh, he, uh, yeah, he buffs the Crypt Flares. So the Crypt Flares are a unit of flying, shooting knights, and they are pretty cool. I like them. They're, they are good. So this guy, he has an ability called Mind Shattering Cacophony. If an enemy, if any enemy models are slain by wounds caused by this unit's fetid breath, so this is a 10 inch range shooting attack, four dice, fours and threes, two rend and D3 damage. So killing one model is not that difficult. Right? If it's a one or a two wound model, you only need one out of the four attacks to go through, right? And it has two rend, so a lot of these models have uh, not great saves, right? Like, this thing can kill a Gut Ripper, for sure, a Hobgrot, right? Like, things like that, no problem. Um, so if he does this, you add one to the damage characteristic of missile weapons used by friendly Crypt Flayers... Uh, that are wholly within nine inches of this unit. So it takes a little bit of setting up, but he's a very good courtier to sort of hang out with the Crypt Flayers. He kills a unit, or he kills a model, and then all of a sudden the Crypt Flayers get way more damage, and, like, it doubles their damage output. So it's a huge buff. So if your opponent's like, well, I'm going to play a block of six of these Crypt Flayers, it's like, well, then the Crypt Infernal Courtier is definitely, like, an auto-include at that point. Yeah, he's good. He can be, he can be quite scary. Yeah, very good. And he flies. He's got 12 inch move, 4 up save, 6 wounds, right? Like he's good. Marrow Scroll Herald. I think this guy is the best courtier. I think he's the best courtier for one very simple reason. He has an ability called Don't Shoot the Messenger. This unit is not visible to enemy models while it is wholly within 6 inches of 5 or more friendly Flesh Eater Court models. He's invisible. So, can't cast spells on him. Can't shoot at him. Can't shoot at him if you're three inches away from him. So, that's cool. Um, I'm not even sure if you can shoot at him if you're face-to-face. -face. I think shooting attacks, you need vision. And he's not visible. As long as he's within six inches of five or more feck units. Another cool thing is that uh, if you're only three inches away, like if you're quite close, he can charge in first. You can't unleash hell. You have to have vision. You can't unleash hell, this guy. And then once he's successfully made a charge, the unit that he's that he's hanging out with, they can charge. Can't unleash hell on them, because there's an enemy model within three inches. So he's pretty cool. He has this other ability that's called the King's Entreaty. Basically, uh, at the end of the charge phase, you pick like the unit that you charged or whatever, or the, you pick one enemy unit within three inches, and you as the opponent get to make a choice. You either, uh, they pick a unit and you either give the unit that they pick strike last, um, or for the rest of the battle, you roll 2d6 before the unit issues or receives a command, attempts to cast a spell or chant a prayer make the roll before the action is carried out. If the roll is greater than the unit's bravery, so our bravery sucks, the unit cannot perform the action in that phase. So it means that if they're hitting a wizard, like even Gobsprack, like even Gobsprack's bravery isn't great, hey? I don't know what offhand, but I know that heroic recovery is not often something that I, that I want to do on Gobsprack. Gobsprack's bravery is six. So if this thing jumps at bravery and they're like, hey, do you want to strike last? No, sorry. Sorry. It's not that. So, sorry. Let me start again over with this ability. I did do a very good job explaining this. I'm just going to read it. At the end of the charge phase, you, uh, you as the feck player, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and say that this unit will be offered an infected bone. If you do so, your opponent must choose whether that enemy unit accepts or refuses the bone. 
If it refuses, the strike first effect applies to friendly feck units within three inches of this unit until the end of the following phase. So everything else around the unit gets strike first. So whatever it is that they picked of yours is strike at last, right? If you accept the bone, the unit then becomes infected. For the rest of the battle, roll 2d6 before an infected unit issues a command, receives a command, casts a spell, chants a prayer. Make the roll before the action is carried out. If the roll is greater than the unit's bravery characteristic, the unit cannot perform the action in that phase. So Gob Sprite doesn't get to cast spells if you accept the bone. If this guy rolls 2d6 and rolls greater, so they need to roll a 7 or more on 2d6. So not that hard. So seems bad. It's like, seems bad. Sometimes this can be really bad, sometimes this isn't going to really matter at all, but his real power comes from being invisible outside of being invisible. It's a good ability. Monsters. Zombie Dragon, Terror Geist, and then Ghoul Kings riding each. The Ghoul Kings are one cast wizards with a fair melee attack that can help generate deeds. The Zombie Dragons and the Terror Geist's attacks do not generate deeds. There's a sub-faction that lets you take monsters with no riders as battle line. It's a monster mass list, but I, it's suboptimal. But it, it, has its, it has its strength. But it's not as good. If your opponent is bringing this kind of list, they're probably not playing the best version of Feck. The Terrorgeist's Fanged Maw uh, is an attack. It might be the only what way that this army generates any kind of significant mortal wound output. Um, it is uh, three attacks, fours to hit, threes to wound, two rend, and d6 damage. But if the unmodified hit roll for an attack on the Fang Ma is a six, it deals six mortal wounds. And there's ways of getting more attacks with Fanged Ma. So I think one of them is just a, uh, a uh, mount trade or whatever. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it can suddenly, this thing can spike and deal like 12, 18, 24 mortal wounds to you. So it can spike. So you have to be careful. It also has two rend and does d6 damage. So, you know, it's all right. Um, Ghoul King on Zombie Dragon is likely the best. It has a War Scroll spell that lets all thick monsters wholly within 18 inches of it run in charge. So that's, that's your monster mesh. Um, that's your monster mash spell right there, right? You just have all these monsters and or three of them or whatever. And then, you know, you can deep strike this guy in and then suddenly boom, everyone's running and charging that turn. It's cool. You probably won't see many of these. They're overcosted. Usheron is better for the point cost. A lot of these, you know, so like the Royal, the Royal Terror Geist is 315 points and the Royal Terror Geist with a Ghoul King is 450 points. A zombie dragon is 310 points, and the with the ghoul king on his back is 440 points. Usheron's 460 points, so he's 10 points more, and he just is, is just better. So, yeah, I mean, you probably won't see many of them. If you do, if you don't see Usheron, it, it, barring points changes too, right? So, at this point anyway, probably won't see a ton of them. Battle line units. We have Crypt Ghouls. Crypt Ghouls are always battle line. They are 25 millimeter bases for 20, for 160 points. They're solid. They have a six of save and 20 wounds. They can get buffed and deal more damage and up to 12 can be returned under the right conditions. So they're, they're solid. Don't underestimate these things. So you can play a, a ghouls list where you just have a lot of stuff that's buffing ghouls. They give them plus one attack, plus one to wound. They auto wound on, on sixes. They, right, like there's ways that you can play just big blocks of ghouls and have them be good and have them be scary so you have to kind of keep that in mind yeah they have two they have two dice each fours and fours and no ren so this is again a hoarfrost dream um yeah if unmodified hit rolls for attacks made by sorry if the unmodified hit rolls for an attack made by this unit is a six that attack automatically wounds if it has 20 or more models on modified hit rolls of five and sixes automatically wound. So this thing can get wounds in. It can be good. Improve the Ren characteristic of this unit's weapons by one if it's wholly within nine of a courtier and 18 of an, of an abhorrent. So the more you have, the harder this is, right? Because they have to be wholly within nine, but still like 40 of them, you know, you're going to throw like uh, 80 dice and fives and sixes auto, auto wound. 
like that's almost 30 it's like 27 point something automatic wounds like hopefully you have good saves and if, if this thing gets whore frosted that's a lot of dice coming at you that's a lot of saves with a lot of rent so again it says improve the rent so if you whore frost three does it give you four rent let me know in the comments i always forget this rule so cool crypt guard these guys are awesome uh, they are 140 points for 10 on 25 millimeter bases. They are battle line in the uh, Morg Haunt sub faction, and they have this cool ability called Armor Armory of Madness. If any wounds caused by this unit's attacks are allocated to an enemy unit, that enemy unit cannot issue or receive commands until the end of the turn. So that's pretty cool. They can shut off. Like if if the Crypt Guard are fighting first, they can turn off all at attack, not all at defense, because your opponent would have already cast this already. But they also turn off inspiring presence so it seems it's pretty good it's a pretty good ability yep they have a five up ward they just have a five up ward wait do they do they yes they have a five up ward in addition add one to ward rolls for friendly feck heroes wholly within three inches of this unit so any any uh, feck heroes that are hanging out close to this guy they have a five up ward too seems good there's a debate about uh usharan if he is going to be able to get this ability. I talked to a good friend of mine, Robin, good player. Uh, shout out to Robin. He said that uh, in previous versions of rules like this and other armies and other things or whatever, that you have to pick one point in the model to be wholly within three of, not wholly within three of any of all the cumulative points of, of the model. So it looks to me like he's not going to be able to get these really big bases. So, And that's good. Yushori doesn't need a four up ward doesn't need it so cool but they're a good unit like they're a good unit crypt guard are good you could definitely like have the thing about crypt guard because they have so ghouls have a six up save and a six up board but guard have a five up save and a five up board so, so that means that if you are bringing back crypt guard with muster then you are getting more value they're harder to kill so bringing them back is is better so you can definitely you know in the more sub subfaction play like a double or a triple reinforced unit of these guys and they can be pretty tar pity so but i mean like they're good uh cryptors in my estimation are better so for 130 points they are 50 millimeters times three they need the hollow morn subfaction but like i said that's probably the one that you'll see they're beefy and they get bonus attacks when they charge. These things will slap if they catch you. Cool. So they uh, their attacks are four attacks, fours and threes, zero rend and two damage. But they um, uh, get improved the rend if they are wholly within nine of a courtier or wholly within 18 of an abhorrent. And if the unmodified wound rolls for an attack made with their melee attack is a six, the damage goes up to three from two so sixes to wound are three damage instead of two and again with with very little rend you throw horror frost on these guys give them all an attack right threes and threes two rend three damage on sixes to wound like seems good like they're good and then we have finally uh in the battle line section we have crit flares so they are 160 points on 50 millimeter basis for three they need the blister skin sub faction so some of the only good shooting in the army they are a mobile flying unit they can carry a foot hero with them this ability is called escort courtier when you pick this unit to move in the movement phase you can pick one friendly feck hero that has a wounds characteristic of seven or less that cannot fly and that is wholly within three inches of this unit if you do so remove that hero from the battlefield after this unit finishes a move you can set up that hero wholly within three of this unit and more than three inches from enemy units so it's cool right like you can just kind of pick up non-flying foot heroes and carry them with you that's neat you can generate points and uh on a unit on a courtier let's say and then you can just pick it up and bring it to where it needs to be to spend its points. I don't know. I like it. I think it's good. I think it's fun. Good war scroll design. They uh, Their ranged attack is called Death Scream. It has a 10 inch range. Four attacks. Fours and threes with two rent and one damage. So if you remember, there's a courtier that goes with these guys that buffs their damage to two damage. So it doubles their damage output. 
So they can easily, as a unit of three, have 12 attacks, threes and threes with all an attack, two rend and two damage. It's really good. It's a lot of dice. It's a lot of dice, right? So script flares are good. The only problem is that the blister skin sub faction. So this, the blister skin sub faction is the sub faction that Moss scans through the uh, book furiously. Moss, use your, use your control F, which was it called blister skin? Okay. Uh, so this is where the abhorrence gained the priest keyword. So it's not, it's not that strong. It's okay, but it's not that good. So they're probably not going to be battle line. Hollow Morn is where is what your opponent's going to be taking. So you'll probably see the Crypt Horrors as battle line, but probably not the Flayers as often. Unless your opponent really wants to play like a big Flayers list. It, like it could be, it could, I'm sure that there's a really good Flayers list out there for sure. Uh, okay, so their defensible terrain. Um, sorry, their faction terrain, the Charnel Throne. It's defensible, add D3 nobility, nobility points, and you can't use Inspiring Presence when you are uh, within 12 inches of it. So, sure, it's good. They have an Endless Spell. Oop, I forgot to add one here. They have a, they have a couple really strong Endless Spells. Uh, one of them... So, is called the Cadaverous Barricade. It has a casting value of 5. It has a range of 24 inches. It is not predatory. So once it's set up, it's set up. It counts as terrain. And so it's like it's like a wall. You put a you put a you put a wall in front of your opponent, and it has this ability called grasping hands. Each unit within three inches of this terrain feature cannot run or retreat. In addition, if any enemy models start a move within three inches of the strain feature, half the distance that model can move when it makes the move. Oh, sorry. So, if they stick this in front of Brutes, they go from a move of four to a move of two, and they can't run. Cool. Sounds, sounds good. The thing about this endless spell that's kind of nutty is it's only 20 points it's only 20 points it casts on a five has a 24 inch range halves the move of your of of the models that are within one that that are within three and they can't run a retreat so it's easy to get rid of right it's easy for us as greenskins to unbind this thing and remove it from the table but it kind of forces us to do that. So this thing is more annoying than anything else. And if you can't get rid of it, if you whiff on your on your roll, this thing could be super annoying. Super annoying. We have a lot of slow dudes, especially Iron Jaw dudes. So it's good. And then the other endless spell that definitely should be on this list. I don't know how I forgot this thing is called the Chalice of Bushoran Usharan. So it has a uh, casting value of 6 and a range of 24 inches. And it is a predatory spell, and so it can, it can move 8 inches. So what this thing does, Keep track of the number of models that are slain within 12 inches of this endless spell. Not wholly within, just within. At the end of each turn, roll a dice for each model that was slain within 12 inches of this endless spell during that turn. Every model. Not friendly model, every model. For each 4-up, the commanding player heals one wound allocated to one Flesh Eater Quartz model within 12 inches of this endless spell. So it doesn't specify, it can, you can heal a hero, you, you can heal you, Yushorin, more healing for him. Ugh. Or you can return one slain model to one Flesh Eater Quartz unit that has a wounds characteristic of one that is wholly within 12 of this endless spell. So you can heal your heroes, you can heal Yushorin, you can heal your knights, and you can bring back uh, ghouls and crypt guard. Your opponent can play 40 ghouls, and then as they lose them, 
half of them come back. It's a four up. As they die, half come back. Seems very good. It's a 50 point and uh, endless spell, so seems good. And it can move, so it can kind of just keep moving up the battlefield. You can kind of stick it between you and your opponent. Seems very good. I'm a fan. You're gonna see endless spells coming out of this. And like, I bet you the standard feck list has at least four casts, at least. You wanna cast Carrion Call, you wanna cast Horfrost. I bet you it's at least four. The, one, the list that I built that I would wanna play has five. And I'll show you that at the end, but yeah, it's good. It's good, it's good. Uh, so also, we also have a, a unit called the Royal Beast Flayers. The Royal Beast Flayers is one of those units that's got like a bunch of different models in it, right? Like there's like, you know, it's got three different profiles and then it's like different units within, or sorry, different models within the unit that have these different, I, I hate units like this personally. Like it's, the game's complicated enough. I don't like, I don't like, I don't like um, the design concept of like Cruel Boys, Beast Killers or Monster Killers. I don't like it. I want to have a unit that does a thing and maybe the at the champion has an extra attack. Maybe they have like a standard bear, like that's fine. But I don't wanna to have to roll four different profiles. Like I don't think that it's good game design. I don't think that the brutes having a champion that has its own profile, a gore hacker that has its own profile, and then the rest of it, it's like, well, I'm gonna roll one model and then two models and then seven models. No, just let me pick up dice and roll them, right? I don't know, bugs me. I understand if it's like you're on a mount, so it's like the guy's got a attack and the mount has an attack, I understand that. But if it's a brute, like, let me just roll dice for brutes. I don't know. Bugs me. So anyway, so uh, these guys are good. The Royal Beast Flayers are good. Uh, they're they're fast. Um, they have a 6-inch move, but uh, they can move... Um, where is it here? They can add 2 to their move characteristic if they're moving closer to a monster that's injured. So that's cool. Uh, yeah. Let's see. 2 in every 10 of these models is a Hound. Hounds have a wound characteristic of two, right? Great. Uh, enemy monsters within three inches of this unit cannot carry out monstrous rampages. Good. In addition, reduce the damage characteristic of weapons used by enemy monsters by one while they're, while they're within three inches of any unit with this ability to a minimum of one. That's good. That's going to hurt Sludge Raker quite a bit. It's going to hurt, um, yeah, because... Sled Tricker has a lot of profiles, and none of them deal one damage. So it's going to really cripple some of our monsters. So keep these things away from our monsters. They, they require no rolls. So keep them away. And then last but not least, we have the Morbeg, Mor, Morbeg Knights. I just, we just call these things Knights. These things are nutty. They're 150 points. They're on 75 millimeter oval bases, and there's three of them in the unit for 150 points. These cavalry can ignore Unleash Hell. Uh, they do impact mortals, so on a four up, let's see. Um, right, so let's just go through them in detail because they're good. So they have a Grizzly Lance, two inch range, two attacks, so six, threes and threes, one rend, one damage, fine. Vicious Teeth and Claws is the mount, I guess. 2 inch range, 3 attacks, 3s and 3s, 1 rend, 2 damage. So, pretty decent damage output. Pretty decent damage output. Each model is dealing 5 damage, or sorry, 5 attacks. So you're going to throw 15 dice, 3s and 3s, 1 rend, half of them are 1 damage, and slightly more than half are 2 damage. So, pretty decent. They're flying. Cool. Uh, let's see. They have a standard bear. Right. Each model in this unit counts as three models for the purpose of contesting objectives. So your three your three models become nine feet on objectives when they charge. Seems good. They can take objectives away from you. And you're going to see them, I think, in blocks of six. You're going to see them as reinforced units. So they're going to count as 18 models when they charge. And don't forget, these guys can deep strike. And then with that carrying call spell from the Arc Regent, immediately move D6. D6 and then they charge so like they're getting where they want to be they're getting where they want to be and they also just have their musician just gives them plus one to charge rolls so 
even if you don't get carry and call off, as long as you have that uh, plus one to charge Grand Illusion ability active, which is just table wide, then these guys, it's not a nine inch charge, it's a seven inch charge. And you can reroll that. So it's like these guys are getting in, even if they don't get all their, even if your opponent doesn't get all the things they want to get off on them, they're still getting in. Seven inch rerollable, like that, come on. Like you're, 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 like they're, they're getting in. And that's worst case scenario, by the way. Seven inch rerollable, that's the worst case. Man. And it's also a plus one run, but whatever. Shrieking charge. After this unit makes a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit. So you can only pick one. That enemy unit cannot receive the Unleash Hell command in this phase. In addition, roll one dice for each model in this unit that is within one inch of that enemy unit. And for each four up, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. So it's not like every model picks a unit that's within one inch to deal its impact to. You only get to pick one enemy unit, and then every model in the knight's unit gets the deal of four up D3 impact mortals. So you can kind of like hide stuff or whatever. So, but still, um, don't put your bolt boys directly behind the screen. Doesn't work. Yeah, they're good. You're going to see a lot of them. So, what do we do about it? Bone splitters. Always watch your back line. They're coming in behind you. Always watch your back line. Wargog Prophet should be able to deal, hopefully, with some heroes. Because the Lookout Sir rules don't apply to his Wargog Mask. Foot of Gork is also good against hordes of Crypt Ghouls or Crypt Guard. Right? Because he just has a built-in horde busting spell. Um, throw your primals at, at this uh, Foot of Gork. If you're going to cast... Right, you'll not you'll take out half of the models in the unit. So it's it's a way that you can just sort of reduce the horde so that it's not dealing as much damage. Buys you some time. Remember, if you're not killing the heroes, that a block of 40 crypt ghouls is just coming back. Um, to be honest, I think bone splitters just lose. Uh, I think that you'll just get out ground. Because that's kind of what bone splitters are all about, right? It's like we just have a lot of wounds and a six up thing and we're just gonna like we're just gonna grind you to death but i think this army just does it better they're gonna recur their units and the units you, you kill they're gonna bring back and i don't know how you get into their heroes like how do you kill their heroes look out sir is gonna just cripple the bone splitter arrow boys and there's no teleports and you have nothing with flying how are you supposed to get behind them try flanking with boars Spread out your boar units. Try to find a hole to get into their back line. And try to get to their heroes that way. That's the best you can do. It's going to be a tough matchup for Bone Splitter players. Just like all matchups are a tough matchup for Bone Splitter players. Am I even talking to anybody? I'm talking to, to Blade. Hey Blade, what do you think? <laughs> hey Blade, how do you beat this? How do you beat Feck as Bone Splitters, man? I don't know. I don't know. Iron Jaws. Always watch your back line. It's going to be the same thing. Always watch your back line. Do not let them get into your into your casters and all that in the back. We have Hand of Gork. So teleporting a buffed up unit of pigs into their throne to kill their general seems good. Do that. Yep. Um, if you're planning on killing uh, Yushorin, be sure that Maw Crusher and everything else you got is going into him. You got to do it. Brutes will do a good job of zoning out ghouls and crypt horrors on objectives because they are only one. So if you can get the Brutes onto an objective and, and push forward on that objective, you can help deny your opponent's ability to actually get feet on, right? Brutes only have a four up save, so Mystic Shield, all out defense. That'll help, right? Uh, your primal dice should be used to either get your teleport off or for unbinding spells. Probably unbinding spells. This is where your Master of Magic um, Weird Knob Shaman is going to be helpful, right? You're going to use your Master of Magic for your own teleports and then your Primal Dice for Unbinds. That's my strategy with Gobsbrack. So that I feel like that's a good strategy here as well. Save those Primals for Unbinds. Yep. Yeah, what else? I mean, we don't really have flying units either. 
So it's just going to be those teleports. You're going to have to be really smart about how you how you get those pigs. And the same thing with your gore gruntus, right? Try to try to spread out. Try to find ways. Try to use your mighty destroyers to get around the enemy units instead of trying to fight them. You want to get around their frontliners and try to get into their heroes in the back. Um, fast and maw crusher right like that's going to be good too like you don't want to commit them into horrors or crypt ghouls or nothing like that you want to you want to get him into the squishy backliners like best case scenario for a maw crusher is he's like killing little heroes every turn and just building up that um that plus one wound plus one attack strength from from victory that's best case scenario for the maw crusher right don't commit him into into units don't put him in a vulnerable position keep him keep him back let the let the battle sort of engage and then from there start teleporting stuff um and just try to just start getting into to their units right i think that abhorrence are a better unit to kill first because if you're not killing if you're like the the proper order to kill things in i guess would be abhorrence and then courtiers and then everything else because if all the abhorrence are dead well then what's on the table is what's on the table that's it. Nothing more is coming back if all the abhorrents are dead. If you kill courtiers first, well, right, like, then it's like, well, then if you kill units, they can still come back. But if you kill all the abhorrents, then at least if you finish off a unit, the courtiers can't bring anything back to a unit that no longer exists. Yeah. Seems good. Crew boys, unleash hell, but not against the more peg knights. Do not put your bolt boys directly one inch behind screens gotta give them a little bit of space because those more big knights are going to shut off their unleash shell but if they're not within one they can't so don't leave your bolt boys exposed and a little bit of room behind the screen so that you can actually unleash shell the more peg knights have to be within one inch to shut off unleash shell for bolt boys so don't let that happen this yeah so there's a lot of things, a lot of the a lot of the abilities in this in the Feck army, um, like for example, Muster Guard or um, the uh, plus one attack one. What's it called? Oh, so many names. Feeding Frenzy. They require that the unit be wholly within a certain range of your of their battle line units or of their units. So some really clever redeploys to move your units back might pull out some of their units from buff range. So it's you, you just gotta play like like Jacob Brandon said in my interview with him. You have to sort of give up the board, and you're you're going to table them. That's that's the plan. You're gonna sort of forfeit the board and table them and win long. So yeah, nasty hex is your friend. Removing a five up board from Yushorin is really helping a lot. So sneaky miasma into nasty hex is going to be a good gobsprack move here, but they're going to have a lot of unbinds, so you have to be careful. Choking mist is good, right? It'll slow down the army. Minus one to, the, to, to their attack characteristic is good. Making them not be able to run is good. Choking mist is a great spell. Use it. Deploy far back. I already mentioned this. See my interview with, with Jacob. Gobsprack is obviously good. You know. Uh, that Screaming Mandrake ability to help stop carrying call is good. Yeah. Uh, clear their screens in the shooting phase and hopefully charge with now free units in the charge phase as a way of getting into their heroes. So if you're stuck in combat with like a bunch of horrors or something, you can maybe try to shoot that unit free so that they, like Gut Rippers or whatever, can charge into the hero and kill the hero in the combat phase. It's... That might be the best thing to do. Again, no teleport, no fast units, no flying units. Like, we're stuck. Cruel boys are gonna have a hard time against Feck because they're gonna they're gonna come at us, and there's nothing that we can really do to get behind them. They're gonna have lookout, sir. Right? They're gonna have all these things. So that's why you really have to forfeit the board, and you have to try to like, yeah, do what you can. But it's gonna it's gonna be tough. I think cruel boys like you, you don't even have the wargog mask, right? Like I think that we're lacking a lot of tools here to deal with an army like this. I know when I played cruel cruel boys against this new feck book, it did not go well. My opponent did get a ten inch a, 
a 12 inch and a 13 inch charge on turn one but still i should have been so far back that he couldn't charge me turn one i i did not heed my own advice i was playing that list with two reinforced units that got rippers and a kill boss in between them yeah i wasn't a fan <laughs> didn't wasn't didn't like it still don't like gut rippers for the record i still don't like them still um, still try to never play them yeah anyway yeah good luck uh, for crew boys players out there playing feck i'm not even sure what to tell you like what do you even do i don't know not much we can do vulture boss play a vulture boss play gobs bracken a vulture boss he's the only thing with flying he's fast he can fly over the screens and get to the heroes that's probably your best bet play a vulture boss and a gobs brack split him up send him two different directions start hunting for heroes i don't know what else to do for big wa so big wa i think probably has the best of all the tools because we're, we are a toolbox army so you can bring lots of stuff our boys with all the defense will prove hard to remove for your opponent. You can sit there on an objective and just kind of stand there. You should be able to do it fairly well. They should be pretty survivable, especially if they're stickers, right? They have two rend and with all the defense, a two up save. That's exactly what we want. And our boys are good in Big Wah. They're not good in Iron Jaws, but they're good in Big Wah. So play some Iron Jaws or play some hard boys. Uh, consider deploying far back to watch your back line. Got to have something in the back line. Got to defend. Got to defend all those casters back there. So whatever you're doing, make sure that uh, you're properly defended. Two units of five brutes on the flanks do well. Even things like uh, hobgrots, right? Uh, Stabas, something like that. Brutes are going to zone out on objectives against a lot of their units, so that's good. Nasty hex again is your friend. Choky mist again is your friend. Gobsprack again is your friend. With Big Wah, when you do decide to commit yourself, you have to go all in. When it is time for you to commit and punch, then do that. Buffed up pigs are gonna be good for taking out taking out heroes. You can teleport bolt boys into weird positions. So they can start picking off heroes. Like six bolt boys, even if they don't have the nasty poison, are still gonna be able to pick off those foot heroes if you can get them in the right position, right? If they're like 11.9 inches away or whatever, right? So they can ignore lookout, sir. So, yeah, seems good. You can do it. You can do it. Gloom Spike Gits, always watch your back line. Gits are gonna have, I think, the best time, to be honest, like squigs, yeah. You can use your Hand of Gork, teleport spell to get behind. That's what I did in my last Gits game. I just teleported a unit of bounders all the way into my opponent's back corner. And I was like, well, these guys are here now, so you're going to have to deal with them. So the, uh, yep, so they're coming. Yep, bounders and hoppers can fly over battle line units to get to the heroes. That's good. This might be the strongest thing that any green skin army has to deal with the threat. Yeah, like we can just sort of skip over their screens and smash into their heroes in the back line. Seems good to me. The impact mortals alone, right? Like if you're rolling, it's it should be enough to, if you're lucky, just to take out the heroes before you even get into the combat phase. And then you can pile in and start fighting units. Um, herd is a good tar pit, so it might be able to keep you short and busy for the entire game. If you can just get the herd on top of him, he, he probably won't be able to, to go anywhere else, right? So that could be pretty cool. Snaff, staff of Sneaky Steel and his helpful for shutting down the, the magic on the on your opponent's side. So try to get that uh, Fungoid Cave Shaman or whatever with an Unbind range to start building up stacks to try to deny their magic. With Staff of Sneaky Steel in, and if you have Scrag Rot, that's three plus one Unbinds. So that's pretty good. I'm a big fan. Conclusion. So it's a good book. I don't think it's as strong as some of the other new books were when they came out, but it is a good book. I think it will need to be balanced over time. I think that some units like the big monsters are too expensive and some units like the Arc Regent are too cheap. Uh, take comfort in the fact that whatever le lessons you learn now will only make you better at beating this army once it gets nerfed a little bit, once it gets changed a little bit. Anything that's like really OP now, you'll learn, you'll learn how to how to beat it, and then later when it's weak, you'll still know how to beat it. Yushorin is a big problem in the army. Think carefully about how you're going to take him down, or not. Maybe ignoring him is the best way to deal with him. I, I'm not sure. There are many tactics that you might be able to deny your opponent if you're, if you're if they're not careful. So... Think carefully at the beginning of your when your opponent declares their tactic how you're going to try to deny that tactic. That's just a good rule, generally speaking. And kill their heroes. 
Kill their heroes. Yep. Uh, this should say fast. If this means using fast units or punching through the battle lines, whatever it is you need to do, kill their heroes. You gotta do it. All right. Um, let's see. What's the last thing? So the very... Yeah, we'll do that in another video. I wanted to sort of like look at some... Look at some example lists. But I think uh, that's something better done in another video. So I'll uh, probably bust out some tabletop simulator and look at... Uh, like how the army's going to look and how it's going to move at least how i would play it so maybe i'm terrible but you'll have to let me know in the comments below like subscribe wow